You know, ever since our personal development lord and savior Tim Ferriss expressed his interest in stoicism, it seems like it's been top of mind and the top of the conversation in the whole personal development space. With everyone from Andrew Kirby. So by really practicing stoicism as a daily routine in 2020, you'll find yourself with this kind of inner fortress. To Matt Diavella. His new book is called Stillness is the Key. The interesting thing about stillness is like, it's not something you buy, right? Like it's not something you go get even. I think it's something that emerges as you strip other things away. Most of his books pull inspiration from the ancient philosophy of Stoicism. To Nathaniel Drew. Put as simply as possible, Stoicism is probably the most practical of all philosophies. Posting videos about Stoicism, I got reminded that 2020 is actually the 10 year anniversary of my own interest in Stoicism. I got into Stoicism as a gangly, awkward cross-country runner in my senior year of high school. And I don't know if it was like a subconscious desire to maybe get ready for the change of going to college, but I was smitten with it and I stuck with it and I had actually Letters from a Stoic by Seneca in my backpack every single day for the first two years of college. Looking back on the past decade, Stoicism more than anything else has shaped me as a man. It's been my dominant philosophy of life and it's motivated me to do everything from running a 50K around a mountain as a chunky 230 pound guy to becoming an atheist. So what if God actually exists, sir? Would he not have been good to you? No, uh, he wouldn't. Because if that were true, it would mean that I had an eternal supervising parent who would never die and let me get on with my life, never let me grow up, would keep me under surveillance. To using death as energy to get stuff done before I die. So adorable these little things are. I will embrace you. They teach us that we're all so tiny in the great existence of the world. And like these little things, we shall all perish. Oh, the end is coming. <laughs> so without any further ado, here are the 10 biggest things that I've learned from Stoicism in the last 10 years. Practicing what you preach is a lesson that I'm still learning, but which I think I'm much better at than when I was a mostly bullshitting 19 year old guy. Really practicing what you preach is just aligning the thoughts in your head, the words coming out of your mouth, and what you actually are doing in the world. You know, the actions you're taking with your hands. And aligning those three reduces a lot of like cognitive dissonance that you get. You know, if you're saying that you're one thing, but you know inside that you're actually something else and that your habits are something else, that wears on you, right? There are really two big ways that I've noticed this has applied to me in my own life. The first is looking at other people and watching if the things that they're saying actually gel and are the same as the way that they're living. And the same is true of online gurus and of like philosophers. You know, if a philosopher has a life philosophy on how to be happy, yet they're super miserable all the time, it probably means that their philosophy is shit, right? The second big way that I've noticed this has impacted my life is that studying myself, I've realized that I have a tendency, probably like many other people, to dive into ideas in self-development stuff and to constantly cram in my brain more ideas on how to be better and then not apply them. So that cramming in of ideas and then spouting them back out rather than putting them into practice is something that I've gradually weeded out of my personality through stoicism. Now, if I see a good idea that I want to apply, I have to take it in, apply it, build it into my personality and either you know take it on permanently or get rid of it before I can move on. The dichotomy of control is a very quintessentially stoic thing. It's recognizing that there are things you can control, there are things that you can't, and if you spend any time worrying and thinking about the things that you can't control, you're being really unreasonable, right? This is something that I've struggled with and it's probably one of the hardest ones for me to grasp personally because I tend to 
catastrophize and worry about stuff sometimes. You know, I remember that like two years ago when Kim Jong-un was threatening to bomb the west coast of America with his nukes, and when it was the first time that he could actually reach the coast because his nukes didn't suck anymore, uh, I remember taking my girlfriend at the time on like a road trip to get her out of the city so that we didn't, you know, die. Um, but now there's no way in hell I'd do that. I really just don't care about the things that I don't control anywhere near as much. This clear division of just asking, can I control the outcome? If the answer is yes, putting in all your energy, and if it's no, then ignoring it, matters so much because it means that you, first off, are more effective because you're putting your energy towards the right things. But second off, you're much more at ease because you know that you're doing all that you can do. There's no need to feel bad or to feel scared when you know that you're doing all you can do to put yourself in a position to win. This one's super funny, but I actually have changed my philosophy of working out and my workout routines based on Seneca. Um, I used to be a big time power lifter bodybuilder guy. When I was like 19, 20, 21, 22, all I wanted to do is get absolutely huge. <laughs> lift heavy, heavy weights and be shredded and built and look like a Greek god. But now I just couldn't give a shit less, <laughs> to be honest. Um, now I've recognized that there's a mode of working out where you can actually save energy for yourself. You know, when I was powerlifting and bodybuilding, I looked great, but I slept 10 hours a night, I cooked for two hours a day, and I ate so much heavy food that like the remaining 10 to 12 hours a day, I was exhausted. Now I recognize that by like swinging kettlebells, plyometrics, breathing exercises, resistance cardio, um, body weight calisthenics, you can build a pretty good physique that feels great and you also learn to move in a lot of interesting patterns and that it fits in much better with a life that's ambitious in more ways than one. Only starting when ready is something that really happens when you know that first off, you as a human being can do this thing. It's like right at the edge of your capabilities. And second off, that the world is ready, that the environment is ready, that the time is right. Then you're more likely to take really big definitive action because yeah, then it removes excuses. But being honest with yourself about when the time is right and when the time isn't is a hard thing to do because it requires patience. I'll give you an example. When I was 19 and up until about 20, I took a gap year from college and I wanted to start some sort of business and I was really interested in public speaking and I was doing like six, like between four and six public speeches a week. And I was getting to be a good public speaker. I presented myself well, I was charismatic. I thought that, you know, my speeches were well, like well received. And I've been doing a lot of study about what makes a good presenter. So I tried to start a consultancy, like a business to business consultancy on how executives could pitch and present better, which is an okay idea. It's definitely not a bad idea, but for me, the time was wrong. Here's why. I personally was not self-disciplined at all. I was slothful, like I was just getting liquored up at least twice a week. I was messy. I didn't have my habits in place in my personal life, let alone my business. And I also, didn't have the thick skin to be able to go out and actually sell anything. I didn't have the ability to go take a no. And so as a result, that didn't work. And also the time is kind of wrong as an individual to start a consultancy like that um, when you're like a 19 year old guy specifically, but the time is kind of awkward for that because there's a lot of really big consultancies like the Dale Carnegie group who are putting on things that are so much better than what any individual could churn out that it's, you know, you're gonna have a hard time competing. So the life lesson to take away from that is when you start when the time is right, you build anticipation and excitement to start. And you also build confidence in it being the right time to start. You know, if you have an idea that you think the world is ready for, and if you look within yourself and you think, I've got the things that it takes to make that happen right now. I've got the experience, I've got the character traits, I'm ready. Well, then you can go all in and have faith. But if you start too early, you're gonna get defeated and discouraged and you're gonna waste energy and time. 
You could start too late, but we'll circle back to that in a second. Transmuting fear into fuel to act is something that I definitely have got a decent handle on now. So you know like the feeling of putting something off, right? When you're putting off what you know you need to do and you start dreading it, it starts just weighing on you, you start to just get stressed out and worried. When you're in that state, all that is is your brain trying to find ways to avoid this scary thing that you're about to face. It's your brain going, how can I find a way around this thing? I'm dreading it. I don't want to see it. Can I make an excuse? You know, can I tell my friends that I can't run the half marathon with them because I broke my ankle and make up an excuse? Are you going to tell your classmates that you can't do the presentation with them because you're sick, because you're too scared? All of those excuses go away and get replaced with energy that's actually useful and productive the moment that your brain realizes that you're in too deep. Once you're in too deep and there's like, there's literally no retreat, you've found yourself in a place where there's no pathway to retreat, then your brain just goes, okay, well, I'm still here to protect you. So I'm going to make you do better. Um, some examples from my own personal life in this are that race that I showed you a photo of from the beginning of this video. I bought the ticket to that before I'd even ran for like two years, maybe a year and a half. And I was super out of shape and I bought a ticket to run the hardest 50 K in my state on a whim. And as soon as I bought it, my attention and my willingness to work out went way, way, way up. Another example is public speaking, like walking up to the stage and going to the thing where, you know, I know today I'm going to speak to 200 people and getting ready that morning. It always feels like, oh man, I hate this. I don't want this. But at that point I was already committed too far. There's already 200 people waiting to see me do a thing. And if I don't do it, I'm going to look like a dick and I'm going to make everyone around that planning crew look like a dick. So showing up was forced. That moment that you put yourself in too far to retreat, you'll get access to all the energy that has been pushed down in the form of fear. In his essay on the shortness of life, Seneca describes how if there was a ship and it got smacked around a harbor and it was buffeted around left and right, you wouldn't say that it had a long journey, right? You would just say it moved a lot, but it's still pretty much in the same place. It's in the same harbor. But if there's another ship that had a captain and the captain and the crew guided that ship through the storm using the rudder and the sails and took that ship and drove it down the coast and landed in a different area, that ship has had a long, successful, productive journey. And Seneca's analogy was, the ship buffeted around the harbor is most men's lives. They never set a destination far off in the future. They never plan what they're going to be. And then as a result, when you look back on it, they've just gone left and right and left and right and left and right. And they've never really moved in any one direction. The ship, on the other hand, that goes in a straight line is the ship of a mind that says, I'm going to do this thing that's like 20 years from now. and I'm going to stick with it until. And then that mind produces a life that makes a lot of sense. And it's really beautiful. In my own life, I have gradually weeded out a tendency that I have. And the tendency is like, I would call it learning ADD. Like I love to become pretty good at something. I'll spend three to six months and I'll get pretty good at lots of things. But now, like I've recognized that person just doesn't get any rewards in life and feels no sense of gratification. You know, looking back on your life, if you say, I'm halfway fluent in Spanish, I'm a pretty good chess player, I, you know, learned a little bit about parenting and raised my kids okay, and you say your whole life is like a B plus, it's a miserable feeling, right? Your whole life being a B plus, A minus. It's much more exciting to say, I'm gonna have one thing, I'm gonna be the best in the world at it. That focus and constancy, is something that is so insanely lacking in humanity and it always has been because there's always been distractions but if you can have that focus over 20 years a normal intelligence can become extraordinary this is another quintessentially stoic idea the idea here is that first off everything in the world is not going to be around forever Everything that you have is going to be gone from you at the very least the day that you die, but likely much sooner. So meditating on that is important because when you do have losses, you know, when family members get sick and die, 
when you do have a car crash, when somebody does rob you and take your money, those things were going to hurt a lot less if you know that they're going to happen rather than thinking that, oh, those are some, you know, impossibility. But also that meditating on the things that you can lose hits a weird sort of cognitive bias in the brain where the brain actually is more afraid to lose something than it is to be excited to gain something. So, you know, if I, if I give you a small gift, you might feel kind of excited, but if I take something of the same value from you, you're going to be infinitely more angry and pissed at me than you were excited previously. So you can kind of like hack that by imagining, you know, okay, I've got my phone. I imagine that somebody comes up to me and just smashes my phone or like a pickpocket grabs it and drops it and runs away and I have to spend 500 more dollars. Imagining that loss and now I have it again gives me this sense of relief of like, oh, thank God I didn't lose that. And that relief is followed up by a feeling of gratitude. Now you can genuinely be happy for the things that you do have. We're all going to die, but your attitude towards it can really change your life. So the stoic idea is pretty much this. If there's some sort of afterlife, the quality of your character, it influences the quality of the afterlife. And most theistic people would agree with that. But the Stoics also say that in a more practical sense, the way that you behave in this world and the way that you are as a human being to the people around you is gonna echo on and on and on. If you want to ground this in experience, just imagine the person that you know who had the worst childhood. Some horrible person did something horrible to the, you know, your friend, or it was their parent, or whatever. That's an example of negative ripples being created by one individual for generations, potentially. Um, in the same way a positive influence can happen, imagine a great teacher that you had. Or maybe like a friend of a friend, like kind of a friendly uncle or friendly aunt character who was just so formative in making you a good person that you're just forever grateful to them. Those two types of people, whether or not they have an afterlife or not, they very practically live on in you and in the way that their characteristics show through you on other people. And so knowing that, now you know that essentially you're in a race. And in that race, there's death as the end line and you're gradually progressing towards it and you don't know when it is. And so you have to rack up as much good uh, achievement, as much benefit as you can for other people, for the afterlife as a metaphor or as reality. And that idea essentially puts a fire under your ass to get going because you don't know when it's gonna be. It could be tomorrow, it could be a hundred years from now. But regardless, it changes your sense of urgency and it leads to a reframing of fear. All of a sudden, fears that were stopping you from taking action are a lot smaller in comparison to death. <laughs> Along the lines of urgency from the last point is a hatred of wasting time. Uh, I've definitely learned this the hard way through stoicism. You know, in high school, I went to a preparatory school that got me ready for college, which means go to school, leave home at 6.30 in the morning, hour and a half bus ride, school from eight till four, hour and a half bus ride home, eat dinner from 5.30 to 6.30, and then study from 6.30 to midnight and do it all again and again and again and again. So my time was taken up in high school, like every moment. Um, then I went to college and I had so much free time and college felt so easy by comparison because I had so much time to do stuff. You know, now I could go out with my friends. I could go get hammered. I could go on like three dates. I could go to the gym with my other friend. I could go on three hikes. I could go to the beach and go surfing and then I could come home and study. But point being, I lost track of my time. Through losing track of my time, I think I gradually got the bad habit of wasting probably half of my waking hours. Maybe three years ago I started this habit and then a year and a half ago I stopped but I tracked every single moment of the day with this time tracker called toggle.com in the description down below. But I used it and I literally tracked every moment of the day. At the end of the week, I'd have a pie chart of where I spent my time on you know, friends, family, wasted time, physical fitness, cooking, work. And I got so neurotic that I went down the rabbit hole and I started getting like hard on myself if I wasted even a moment of the week. And that just wasn't the right answer. Now I think I've fallen into a happy medium, which is 
if I feel like I'm starting to waste my life a little bit. I'll take one or two days and I'll track every moment of the day and I'll see where am I spending my time. So this idea is kind of like counterintuitive because I said I'm an atheist, but it's really valuable. The idea is that each and every one of us have a part of our brain which knows what the very best possible thing that we're capable of being is. That part of the brain knows what your highest self is. It knows good and evil, and it knows you know where on that line of good and evil your actions lie. At least on your own personal compass, but most of us have a very similar compass. And having all of that knowledge, that part of your brain is constantly 24 seven awake and aware, watching you, watching your actions, judging you, and then informing you about those actions, about whether whether or not you're living up to your own standards, your highest self. And if you are, you have this feeling of ease and health and vitality and joy. And if you're not, you feel like, you feel tyrannized by that. You feel like you're a piece of garbage, constantly attacked by that part of your brain. <laughs> At least that's the way that I've felt it and a lot of people that I've talked to have felt it. But in realizing that that's just a part of human nature, it's like the superego in psychology, right? Realizing that that exists and that there's no getting around it, it's better to run towards it. You know, in my own life, I've seen this specifically with drinking, right? I used to drink a ton. Drinking made me really depressed and broke a lot of meaningful relationships in my life. And I, w I was using it as essentially an escapism thing. And now it's like, even if I drink one or two beers and it causes me no problems in life, that part of my brain now knows how damaging drinking is and it will beat me to a pulp psychologically. Like the guilt that I will feel over having one or two beers with dinner and not getting drunk is unfathomable. <laughs> but that's just important. Like you have to listen to that part of your brain because it's not gonna go away. And whether you listen to it now and you change your life or that part gets stuffed down by prescription meds and booze and bad habits, it's going to win and you're going to have to change. And you either change when you're young or you change when you're middle-aged or when you're old, you realize that you can't change because it's been too long and you've ruined your life. And then you're stuck dying with that voice inside. So I want to end with this. I've been learning stoicism really intensely for the first two years and pretty intensely for the last like 10 years. And I just barely feel like I'm starting to get a grip on some of the very basic tenets of it. Starting to see those things actually become a part of my personality at a deep level. This is a process that is not hypey, it's not beautiful, it's not exciting and shiny and new. It is pretty boring, it is pretty emotionally difficult because it means attacking and focusing on the hardest and most unpleasant parts of your own psychology and of the human experience. But at the end of the day, if you're willing to put in the work and master the philosophy of stoicism, it's going to make you more effective in the world and it's going to make you more at ease in the world. So until the next video, keep mastering your psychology, keep mastering your physiology, and keep moving forward.